right, welcome to WSQ 36. Today we are going to start going from our introduction on animals, and we're going to start talking about the different inver invertebrate phylums. And today we're going to talk about basically uh, four different groups, sponges, cnidarians, worms, and mollusks. So there's a lot to get in here. We're going to talk about the main characteristics of sponges, the main characteristics of cnidarians, the main characteristics of worms, and the characteristics of each of those um, specific phylums of worms. Uh, the main characteristics of mollusks and the main groups of mollusks. So there's a lot to get into and we're going to get at it. First group we're going to talk about are what are known as sponges. Um, sponges are uh, organisms that, that, that when we talk about invertebrates, okay, invertebrates remember are organisms that do not have a backbone, okay, so <coughs> This group is uh, the majority of organisms that we're going to learn about, okay, are going to fit into this. In fact, of the 1.5 million um, species, most of them, you know, uh, fit into the invertebrate class. Um, sponges have no body symmetry, so that means they're asymmetrical, as we've learned before. They have no tissues or organs, so we don't see in sponges a large division of labor where you have different tissues. They just have cells that have uh, specific functions within the sponge. We're going to talk about those in just a minute. They can reproduce asexually um, and sexually. Um, what The way they reproduce sexually is kind of interesting. What will happen is sperm will just literally be released into the uh, water by that particular sponge, and then it will end up fertilizing another sponge uh, the eggs of another sponge and that produces their offspring. If you look at sponge, they have a central cavity right here in the middle and that central cavity is surrounded by specialized structures. So let's take a look at some of the structures. Um, sponges have these open pores right here, okay? And the pores allow water to move into, right? So they come in through the pore and into the central uh, cavity. Um, and then exits through the hole at the top. And what happens as it comes into the central cavity in the spores, they have these little little collar cells. On the edge of the collar cells are these little whip-like structures, kind of look like little hairs, that beat back and forth. See these right here? And those actually move water through the sponge and trap food. So as food gets trapped here into the collar cell, that's how they actually are able to ingest it and, and make use of it. That's why sponges are known as Filter feeders, okay, and that's a word we're going to want to make sure we know. Okay, they're filter feeders. They feed by filtering water and taking out the nutrients in that. Sponges also have these things inside of their body structure known as spikes. You see them right here, right here, and right here. Um, spikes are just a form. They, they're rigid, and they actually help give support and structures. They're almost like little... Um, little skeletons inside of the sponge that help protect the sponge's body and give support to the frame. And then they have these jelly-like cells that are on the inside between the collar cells and, and the outer cells of the sponge. Um, these are where digestion and um, distribution of food, uh, removal of waste, uh, where the egg and the sperm are produced, they're all produced in these cells right here the jelly-like cells. So you can see sponges, while they don't have any vast organs or organ systems, they do have cells um, that are working independently, but as a colony, basically, as a group to help the sponge live. Those are sponges. Oh, one more thing. Sponges are known as periphera. That is their that is their particular phylum. Okay, so periphera. Think of the word porous, okay, pores that comes from that word. The second group we're going to talk about today are cnidarians. Okay, cnidarians are also invertebrates. Cnidarians have two basic body plans and we can see them below here. They have uh, a polyp body plan or a medusa body plan. Um, the polyp is kind of a vase shaped. It's usually connected um, at a, a hard uh, surface. The medusa plan is more of an upside down bowl shape. Okay. Um, Cnidarians can have one or the other. Polyp might be animals like sea anemones are polyps, hydras are polyps, coral are polyps, okay? And that's for their whole lifespan. They're in that shape. Medusa, think of like a jellyfish. Um, Medusa actually is the adult version of the jellyfish. Jellyfish start as a polyp, as we're going to see uh, in, a, in a moment here. So cnidarians can come in these two basic body plans. Um, what makes cnidarians all the same is that they use stinging cells to capture food and defend themselves. Here's an example of a stinging cell below. 
The stinging cell is basically this little cell that would be um, on the cnidarian. On the edge of it, it's got a trigger. If that trigger gets um, activated, then it will shoot out these spines, which are, see how they're wrapped up and coiled up inside of that cell? And the stinging cell will fire out those spines, and those spines get fired into whatever organism that they have, and they can have poisons on them. That's why if you go down to a beach, you never mess around with jellyfish, because it may be dead, but those stinging cells still can be triggered and can still fire. And so you can still get stung even after the fact of uh, you know being dead for a while. So they use these stinging cells to capture food and to defend themselves. Right? That's a big quality that they have in common. Um, they also move, um, and they move to escape danger and capture food. Uh, they reproduce. Cnidarians do asexually and sexually. Um, polyps, so those types of organisms like hydras, corals, and sea anemones, uh, they reproduce in a process uh, often called budding, where like we saw in, if you remember back in bacteria, yeast will reproduce that way. Um, certain organisms that'll bud, so they'll, they'll actually have a bulge of a smaller organism that grows out of the side and then it pops off and that becomes another organism. And that, that would be asexual because it produces a, a carbon copy, a clone of the original. Uh, Medusas typically reproduce sexually. Okay, so you have uh, sperm and egg, you have male and females uh, in that particular group. Here is just a Nidarian life cycle for you to take a look at. Um, so this is kind of interesting. So adult Medusas, it's, we're talking about jellyfish here. This is a moon jelly. So the adult Medusa reproduces sexually, so it releases eggs, and a female, re a female releases eggs, and a male will re re release sperm. The egg and the sperm will actually uh, unite in the water. So when the sperm cell fertilizes an egg cell, this all happens outside. We call this external re uh, sexual reproduction. Okay, The reason why it's external, it's outside of an organism's body. What will then develop is the what's called a larva. A small larva that swims will start to develop from that first zygote. The larva will find a space and it will actually attach to a hard surface and it will develop into a polyp. So this is that polyp stage. It looks kind of like a vase. The polyp will reproduce asexually and how the polyp reproduces is through this process of budding. So you get these, these little um, disc shaped structures that kind of grow up on top of each other and then they'll pop off one at a time and that disc will ultimately mature into a medusa and look what you have that exact same cycle that continues and continues and continues so in the case of a moon jelly those types of cnidarians you'll have a polyp and a medusa stage and you'll see both sexual and asexual reproduction in the case of let's say <coughs> sea anemones organisms like hydras, then they're just polyp stage and you're not going to see um, both forms. You'll see one form of reproduction, not the other. Thirdly, worms. I told you this is a lot, so we're going to stick at it. Worms are the third group we're going to talk about. Worms are invertebrates. All worms have a couple characteristics. They all have long, narrow bodies without legs, no legs on worms. And worms come in three major phyla. I have them right here listed for you. They have Platyhelminthes, which is more commonly known as flatworms. They have Nematoda, which are commonly known as roundworms. And they have Annelida, which we know as segmented worms. Okay. Platyhelminthes, they have a long body, okay, that's flat. All right. Nematodes, long body that's round. Segmented worms, a long body that's round, but it's made up of linked segments, as we'll see with the earthworm. You can see the individual segments uh, as we look at those. So those are the three phyla that we see in worms. Platyhelminthes, flatworms, nematodes, roundworms, and annelida, segmented worms. Now, generally, the body structure of worms follows a couple characteristics. They're bilateral symmetry. Okay, so we can divide a worm straight down the middle and we'll get equal halves, but we can't divide it in a radial symmetry. They have tissues, so they have defined tissues, cells, tissues. They have defined organs and they have defined body systems. Um, worms are the simplest organism that actually has a brain, so brain. So they're the first of the um, of the invertebrates that we've dealt with that actually have a brain. Now we call their brain a ganglia. It's small. It's not like our brain. It's very simple. Um, but it controls the body functions of, of the worm. And so they're the first one with that. There's 
Uh, Cnidarians have a nervous system, but their nervous system is not combined into one particular brain. It's basically just response mechanisms. Worms reproduce uh, asexually or sexually, depending upon the different organisms. Planaria, which is a type of flatworm, they actually can divide themselves in two. So a planaria, kind of, they can kind of look like this. Let's just say, here's my little flatworm. Okay, so a little planaria, and they have these little eye spots on the top. So the planaria will actually split himself off, and it'll end up having another planaria that forms out of that one. That's a, their form of asexual reproduction, because they have the same genetic information. And that leads to uh, basically a copy of the original. Some worms are hermaphrodites. Okay, hermaphroditic. That means they both have male and female sex organs. We'll see that in earthworms. Um, but you need to understand it's rare for them to actually fertilize their own eggs. They typically it takes two different worms, and one will supply the sperm, and the other the eggs. Um, but sometimes it happens. But that's still not considered. That's still considered sexual reproduction because you have a sperm and an egg that comes together to produce a zygote. So it's not a exact copy of the original organism. Uh, let's talk about each a little bit more specifically. Flatworms are flat and soft body. Uh, many flatworms exist as parasites. Those that live inside of a host uh, organism and basically leech off of that organism. Uh, example of, of parasitic worms are tapeworms. Um, some worms that are flatworms are also free living. That means they, they actually live in water environments and they feed on smaller organisms to survive. And planaria would be an example of free living flatworms, the ones that I showed that divide themselves in half. Now here's just a real quick image, just want to show this to you. Uh, one worm that's a type of flatworm we may be familiar with is tapeworms. If you've had a dog um, a lot of times you have to treat them for tapeworms. What happens, a tapeworm is a parasite. It's a, uh, it's a flatworm that lives in hosts. And what will happen, so a dog, let's say, uh, eats an animal that's infected with a tapeworm. The, the, what will happen, the immature tapeworm will actually use, has hooks and suckers on the face of the worm. The tapeworm will use hooks and suckers on its head. It will dig into the lining of the dog's digestive tract. <laughs> Great, isn't it? So it attaches to the, as we can see right down here, it actually attaches to the wall of, let's say, their, the dog's intestines. As it grows, it absorbs food inside of the dog to the extent that, <coughs> to the extent that this particular parasitic flatworm <coughs> will actually absorb so much food that it makes the dog sick. The dog, obviously, the tapeworm can then leave the dog through the dog's waist and then the waste gets on vegetation, another animal eats it. As it eats the eggs that have been uh, uh, released in the feces of that animal, boom, now you have that animal getting the tapeworm and this cycle just continues to exist. Tapeworms can be really long and really disgusting, um, but they're a very specific type of flatworm that's designed, um, they can grow really massive, to just leech off of another organism, so it's parasitic. The next one here, and I made a mistake, so let's take a look at this. The next one here would actually be, not segmented worms, F, these would be roundworms. Okay, roundworms have digestive systems that are like a tube. Okay, so they have a, a, a definite opening, which we would call the mouth on one end, and then inside that worm, they'll have a long one-way system, okay, that it's known as the alimentary canal. It's open at the front and at the, the end, okay? Different from flatworms that actually feed from <clears throat> one spot and they don't, doesn't track all the way through the body. Um, the food enters at the mouth, it exits at the anus, the other end of the worm. The alimentary canal is a one-way digestive system and why alimentary canals are so functional is because they're more complex. The food can be broken down from larger to smaller to smaller to smaller thereby giving the greatest amount of absorption to that animal. And so we have, for example, humans have an alimentary canal. We have a digestive tract. And so the most um, food and nutrients can actually get absorbed out of their food. So that's what roundworms, their big function is, this, this digestive system that's unique and new. Segmented worms, which are represented by earthworms and other segmented worms, they have bodies that are made up of linked sections called segments. Um, these are worms that have really well-developed organ systems. We're going to see those when we do the dissection. 
These are worms that have a closed circulatory system. That means that the blood in these particular worms stays in the blood vessels. It never leaves the blood vessels. So as you see even in this drawing, um, right here we have the blood vessel on top of the worm's alimentary canal and the blood vessel on the bottom. Um, just like, uh, flat, like we saw in roundworms, they do have one long alimentary canal that goes all the way through the worm that's used for digestion. And you'll see that they do have some more structures. They've got a small brain at the top known as the ganglia. They have um, these things right here in the middle known as aortic arches, which are like little hearts. Uh, they have blood vessels. They have a nerve cord that runs the length. They've got um, special organs that remove waste that are called nephridia that are like kidneys. They have reproductive organs, male and female, to allow them to produce sperm and egg. And so they have, uh, as, as an organism, worms actually have quite a bit of, of um, structural complexity in their particular uh, organs. Next, let's talk about mollusks. <laughs> so we're on the last one. Mollusks is the last group we're going to talk about. And mollusks are a group of animals that are also invertebrates. All of these have been. They have soft, unsegmented bodies that are often protected by a shell. Um, all mollusks have a structure in them called a mantle. This is a thin tissue that covers their internal organs um, and also oftentimes produces the shell. They all have a foot, which is a muscular organ that's used for movement, and we'll show that. The mollusk body structure is bilateral. Okay, They do have an alimentary canal and they do have organs. Um, most mollusks have an open circulatory system a uh, closed circulatory system, like in the case of earthworms, as we said, the blood stays in vessels. In an open circulatory system, the blood is not always inside the vessels. It actually can be dumped out. Oftentimes, they'll have a heart or some type of pump that pumps the blood out over the organs. The organs gather nutrients and oxygen they need, and then it gets pooled and kind of pumped back into the heart. Um, mollusks that live in water also have gills. So we're seeing some structures that are kind of unique in this, this group that we haven't seen yet. Of course, remember gills are finger-like protrusions, um, that little cilia that basically are able to get uh, oxygen out of water. Now, mollusks are similar in some ways. Uh, you could look at them and you might say, wait a second, um, what's a snail and a clam and a squid all have in common? I mean, if I look at these, snail lives on land, slow creature, clam lives in the water, it's got a big double shell, squid doesn't have any shell at all. What do they have in common? Well, these are three different mollusks. They belong to different mollusk groups, but notice, look at the similarities. So snails, for example, snails have a foot. The foot is the, the base of the snail's body. Okay, that's the portion they move with. Clams also have a foot. They can actually dig, if you ever go clam digging, um, you have to dig pretty quick to get underneath them. They can actually dig down in the ground pretty quickly, so they have a muscular foot. Squid, all their tentacles in that lower part of their body is actually called the foot. It's the developed foot of that particular animal. You'll notice that snails have a single shell. Um, snails also have um, a, a set of a digestive tract that is alimentary, that has an opening at the mouth and a, a closing um, portion where food is extracted. Um, you can see that they have, they all have a mantle, that interior uh, tissue that actually secretes uh, the shell and protects the inner organs. We see that with clams, the same thing. Alimentary canal, the mantle, um, same thing with the squid, alimentary canal at the mouth through, okay, down into the, uh, the actual um, shell, okay, which squid actually do have a shell that sits underneath their head, as I've done squid dissections. You've observed that. So they don't look a lot alike, but mollusks do have some similarities. Now there are some diversity in mollusks, um, and this is our last one here. We can see there's three major groups. You have gastropods, you have bivalves, and you have cephalopods, okay, that fit into this particular group. Uh, gastropods are also known as univalves. They have one shell or no shell, okay, so this would be like a, uh, a slug or a snail. Um, gastropods um, have what are called uh, radula or radula. Okay, those are actually little teeth that allow them to munch up the ground as they go around. And these little teeth are almost like little rotating, almost like a, um, if you've ever used a, oh gosh, a chainsaw. Okay, they almost like look like that kind of teeth. And that's how they actually mow down their food and eat it. And it comes into the alimentary canal. These tend to be scavenger animals, or they can also, um, they can also, eat other organisms that are smaller. You have bivalves, which have two shells instead of one, like clams. 
These are filter feeders, so different different structure, and they have limited movement. They're pretty much where they go is where they stay. Uh, they don't move often in their lives. Cephalopods are probably the most developed of the mollusk uh, clan. Those live in oceans. Um, the foot actually makes up their tentacles. This would be like the octopus or squid. They have a closed circulatory system, so the blood's inside of their body. And they, have, uh, they, they are carnivorous, and they have actually pretty developed brains. Octopus are actually pretty intelligent creatures. So mollusks can come into all of these three groupings, so you don't just see them in one. Um, you have bivalves, gastropods, and cephalopods. So all together, those make up all of the invertebrates that we're going to start with. So we talked about today uh, mollusks, we talked about worms, we talked about um, sponges or periphera, and we also um, talked about, and I'm losing my train of thought, what is the other one we talked about? The last one we talked about were cnidarians, jellyfish. So you've watched the summary of uh, the WSQ. Please summarize this one. I expect a pretty good summary. Answer those questions that we've been scattered out through this, and I will see you guys in class. Bye.